Good evening, good evening, good evening. And thank you for joining us for yet another Bible study here at MOMBC. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness and grace toward us. Thank you, God, for this opportunity that we have to study your word. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will open up our hearts, our minds, and our souls, that we shall receive this truth that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. To God be the glory. <clears throat> we are picking right back up uh, in Genesis, where we left off last week, talking about Abraham and how he was called by God, specifically chosen by God. But it wasn't just Abraham that was chosen. It was his entire uh, household. His family was going to be blessed so that uh it would fulfill the promise that God had made to uh, made to him in his family being blessed and being a blessing to others so that we that are of Abraham's seed could receive all that God had for us. So uh, last week we stopped on verse number one of Genesis chapter 15. So I'm going to read that one and then go to verse number two. Genesis chapter 15, verse number one, and then we'll go to verse number two. Christian Standard Bible says it like this. After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. And remember, uh, we said that these events talk about the things that happened to him um, in the rest of chapter 12, chapters 13 and chapter 14, um, as far as the challenges that he had. Uh, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your reward will be very great. Verse number two, but Abram said, and remember I left off, I said, okay, you're making promises, Lord, but I'll see how you're going to do it. I'm childless. I just don't want you to forget that piece. I'm childless. Uh, God, verse number two, but Abram said, Lord, what can you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar. I pronounce that correctly. El Eleazar, El, El Eleazar. El Elizir, um, the heir of my house is El Elizir of Damascus. Abram continued, verse number three, Lord, you have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. Uh, 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 God, I, 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 I'm a little confused. I'm a little confused, God. You know, I, you talking about I'm going to be a blessing, my reward is going to be great, and it's going to come through my family, but I ain't got no charity. I don't have a child, God. How are you going to do that? I don't have a child. I don't understand. I, how are you going to feel it? There comes times in our lives where we're looking for God to fulfill a promise in the way that makes sense in our own head. We're looking for God to fulfill a promise, catch this, in a way that makes sense in our own head. If it's logical to us, then it will make sense. But if it's not logical to us, Lord, I don't know how to where you going to do that. I, 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 I don't know how you're going to do that. that. That's a problem. That's an issue that not just folks that don't have a child have, but that's an issue that some Christians have. Have some of us, even the best of Christians, even the most faithful Christians, sometimes we get to that place where we're like, but God, it doesn't make sense. It's not logically sound. I was talking with some preachers uh, last week and we were talking about the fact that most men are made up from the logical point of view and most women are made up from a, uh, uh, you know, we call it faith, but they just, you know, they just do stuff. And it's like, whereas men, we're thinking, okay, 
Okay, how does that make logical sense? How you know? How can I you know, piece it together so that it makes sense in my own mind? Most women are saying, "Okay, all right, this is what I want to do, and I'm going to do it." But it doesn't make logical sense. And that's you know, uh, I have a coworker that said, "You you just don't think like me." And I said, "I'm not supposed to. I'm not supposed to think like you. Men are not supposed to think the same way as women. In the same way, women are not supposed to think the same way as men. We're not supposed. We're not wired to think the same. That's what's great about diversity and great about the fact that God made man and He made woman." Men think differently than women. It's supposed to work that way. My point to this is Abram, being a man, he's thinking logically. God is not making sense. I'm not saying that God is a woman. I'm just saying that Abram is thinking logically. It does not make sense. And God is saying, look, before we get to God's response, we've we got to look at it from Abram's human standpoint. It does not make sense. I hear what you are saying, but I do not have a child. Okay, the uh, his uh, the heir of my house is Elizier of Damascus. Okay, may have joined the journey during travel from Haran to Canaan, since Damascus is situated between the two locations. The act of transferring the heir's rights to the steward of Abram's house would have been a last resort to ensure Abram's legacy. He says, well, you know, he's one of my servants. He's an heir of Elizir of Damascus. Okay, you going to make my name great through him because I don't have a, a child. The transference of an heir's blessing from a firstborn to another person was not an unusual in the native of Abram's descendants. And when he talks about in verse number three, uh, I don't have any offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. Ancient adoption practices allow for a childless couple to adopt another man as household servant or steward. This person would then care for the couple in their old age and provide a proper burial when they die. As a result, this person would then inherit the family property. This allowed for an heir and continuation of the family line. So, familial love and care, while possible, you know, how people adopt because they can't have a child. You know, some people adopt because they're unable to bear children. And so they say, well, we're going to adopt, uh, you know, for for love and care. It's possible that that's what it could have been done for, but that wasn't the primary reason for adoption during ancient times. Instead, the relationship was more like a business contract between adults, okay? Uh, yeah, uh, in, in other words, it was so that, you, you know, you heard me talk about the person would be um, adopt it so that they can care for the person to OA. They were thinking about the long-term goal. I'm not just thinking about, okay, I'm going to adopt so that I can provide love and care. I'm adopting so that I've got somebody to take care of me when I grow old. Um, Dr. Audrey uh, Battle, uh, God rest her soul, she used to always say, <laughs> she used to always tell me, uh, it is good to have sons. It's good to have boys. She said, but it, it ain't nothing like having a daughter. She said, I, I wish the Lord would have blessed me with a daughter. Uh, and, and then she said, because the daughters will take care of you. Sons, eh, they, they, they may not take care of you as well. And, and, and so, and I say that, you know, uh, with a smile because I, I used to wonder, what did you mean by that? And I have seen instances where families that have sons, that you know, the, the mom or the dad had a son, it's like, oh, now I kind of see what uh, Dr. Battle was talking about. Uh, and, and, and so my point is, uh, Abram didn't go about adopting so much because of, you know, I, I want to provide a home. I'm adopting, so I got, I got somebody to take care of me. I got somebody to make sure that, that I, they don't put me in a nursing home somewhere or something of that nature, okay? Abram's thinking about it logically. I don't have a child of my own. So how in the world are you going to do this? 
I'm so glad you asked the question, Abram. Verse number four. Now the word of the Lord came to him. This one will not be your heir. Look, great that he's a part of your family, but he ain't going to be the one. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. I know I've said this before. How my mom and I used to, uh, you know, we used to teach each other, and I say, well, uh, she'll say, that's your daddy. And I say, well, that's your husband. And she said, but well, that's your daddy. And I say, well, you married him. And she said, well, you the seed. And then I'll be like, I ain't got nothing to come back with that because it, it, I am his seed. You know, come from your own body. God said, look, don't worry about that one right there. He not going to be the one. I'm not making the promise. Through him, I'm going to bring one from your own body, Abraham, okay? Uh, from your own body will be your heir. Verse number five, he took him outside. Oh, Lord, have mercy. He took him outside and said, look at the sky and count the stars. If you are able to count them. Take a look at that sky right there. You see all them stars? I want you to count. God, just as much as it didn't make sense when I bent it to you in verses 2 and 3 about not having a child and then God that I picked up along the way going to have to be my heir. I can't count them stars. There's too many of them. Exactly my point. Then he said to him, verse number 5, your offspring will be that numerous. Just as much as you can't count them stars, that's how your offspring is going to be, okay? Previously in chapter number 13, he said to him, your descendants were going to be like the dust of the earth, okay? It's going to be the assertion that Abel's descendants will be as numerous as the stars is one of the most prevalent promises in scripture. God did not dismiss Abel's frustration, nor did he give an explanation. Instead, God merely reaffirmed his promises. If God had kept his promises thus far, Abram could trust that God would keep his promises in full. It's important that we catch that. Let me read that part. Let me read that first part again. God did not dismiss Abram's frustration, nor did he give an explanation. Instead, God merely reaffirmed his promises. It's often been said that we are not supposed to question God. I was talking with a preacher one time a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, and he was talking about uh, uh, one of his uh, members had challenged him in the idea of we're not supposed to question God, particularly when someone dies. And he said, no, 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 no. We're not supposed to question God's sovereignty. But at the end of the day, I it, it hurts, I, Lord, but, but, but God, I, you know, why didn't you do it the way that I was expecting? God, why, why didn't you heal them on this side? Why, you know, things of that nature. Yeah, I'm supposed to have questions just like Abram had questions. It doesn't make logical sense to, in his mind in the same way. There's things that happens in our lives that we tend to, you know, kind of question, Lord, that just doesn't quite make sense to me. I, I'm a little, you know, I'm a little bewildered by that piece. I'm a little bewildered by that particular fact. And so in the same, but I, I, I make mention of that because God likes for us to come to him. You come to him about everything. Lord, I'm frustrated. I don't understand. And I need a little help with this. Because it, it's not making sense to me. I, 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 you know, in those times where we are doing the right thing, but things seem to be going haywire. That, that's the time to question, Lord, I'm doing the right stuff. I, I, I'm doing what you asked me to do. Why is this stuff not falling into place? God it may not necessarily give us an explanation, but he doesn't dismiss the fact that we're frustrated. He doesn't dismiss our feelings. Why? God got frustrated. Y'all, most of us have read that piece in Genesis where he said that he repented the fact that he had made man 
And, and in his frustration, he said, I'm going to wipe them all out. I'm going to get rid of all of them. I did, what the world did I do this for? Why, why did I uh, find myself naked man in our own image? I should have, <laughs> excuse me, I should have stuck with what I was doing. I should have, I, I should have just stuck with us. I, I should have left the world chaotic and things of that nature. And, uh, and he said, in my frustration, I, uh, in my frustration, yeah, I'm going to get rid of all y'all. I'm going to get rid of all y'all. Oh, but he did not. He, he, I, he repented me that I made y'all, but you know what? I did, I did buy one, and I'm going to take that door boy over there, and I'm going to make sure that he is uh, he's right and because he is already right. But I, I, I'm going to take him, and I'm going to uh, replenish the earth. But he got frustrated. He was mad. He got <laughs> All I did for them, and this is how they treat me. Abel was frustrated, and God did not dismiss his frustration, nor did he give him an explanation. He didn't say, okay, this is why I did it. Sometimes, I, <laughs> what happens to us is in our frustration, we are expecting God to explain the why to us. We are expecting God, okay, God, I'm coming to you with my frustration. I'm coming to you frustrated, I'm bitching, I'm, I'm a little irritated, things of that nature. I'm not questioning your sovereignty, but I am questioning the place that I'm in right now. I'm not questioning that you are God alone, but I am questioning, God, what, you know, I was hoping for a different outcome or, or it just doesn't make sense to me. We're expecting God to explain to us why he did a thing. And then when he does explain to us, unfortunately, in this day in time, there are a lot of people that when God does not explain himself, they dismiss him. Oh, God, Lord have mercy. Instead of him dismissing you, they dismiss him. Because it's like, well, you didn't explain to me why you did a thing. You know, back in the day, you didn't question why. First of all, you didn't get a grown folks conversation, but you definitely didn't ask a, a, a grown up, an adult, a grown up. We got grown ups. We say adult. You didn't question a grown up why they did a certain thing or explain to me why you did that thing or why. We didn't ask them why because you got popped across the mouth or you got hit so hard you fell on the floor. My generation came along and we started testing the line and testing the waters about asking, you know, why you do a certain thing. But we knew when and we knew with who to ask the question. I knew I could ask my, my uh, daddy why because he would say, because I said so. And then I said, but why? And then he said, no, no, no. But I couldn't ask my mama why. No, so my mama, because I said so, I admit it. And don't ask me again. Okay, I'm done. All right, I'm not asking you again. We knew who to ask and we knew when to ask the question why. The generation behind me, no, they ask the question why. And then they give you a dissertation, uh, uh, you know, well, uh, according to what I have studied, da, 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 da. so why do you tell me that I should do such and such? And you know, older adults are getting frustrated because it's like, well, we didn't come from that time, and it's like you didn't. But this is a different time period, and so that those generations that are coming behind me, they're expecting God to answer the question why or explain to them why he did a certain thing. And when they, and he doesn't explain it to them, they're like, okay, well, I, I'm writing him off now because he didn't explain to me why he did a certain thing. I don't have to explain to you anything. I don't have to tell you why I didn't do it, why I did a certain thing or why I didn't do a certain thing. But what God will do and what he did for Abram is he reaffirmed his promise. He said, I'm not going to explain to you why I hear your frustration. I get you, bro. But at the end of the day, I am going to reaffirm. Just take comfort in knowing that I have made a promise and I'm going to keep my promise. Just like I told you in two chapters earlier that your offspring is going to be like the dust of the earth. I'm reaffirming that I said to you that I am going to make your name great. I am going to bless you beyond measure and your, your descendants are going to be as numerous, not only as the dust of the earth, but as the stars in the sky. He reaffirms for Abraham. And, and, 
Thank you, Holy Spirit. I, I honestly believe that I, I, you know, put emphasis on that because somebody needed to hear that tonight. That at the end of the day or today, whatever you're listening to, somebody need to be rest assured that yes, God hears you. Yes, God sees your frustration and he is going to keep his promise. You just got to stay faithful. You keep going to him. Keep running to him. Keep seeking him. But he's going to reaffirm his promise. I got you. I got everything worked out. And if I told you before I was going to do it, I am going to do it. Ooh, Lord, have mercy. Amen. Verse number six. Abram. Ah, yes, sir. Abram believed the Lord. Before I get to the next part, Abram believed the Lord. Abram did not simply feel good about his relationship with God when he believed him. He demonstrated faith when he trusted that these promises would come to pass. He trusted in the guarantor of those promises. Abram knew what his descendants would someday find out that the Lord is faithful and keep his promises. Keeps his promises. Abram believed the Lord. It wasn't, uh, again, it wasn't just a mere fact, okay, that was good. I believed the Lord. No, he believed him to the point that he trusted in his relationship with him. He added, verse number six, the second part says, and he credited to him as righteousness. Who credited to him? God credited to him for righteousness. Abram's belief did not go on. Uh, noted in verse number in the in the King James version, it said he counted it to him for righteousness. He considered, he credited it to him. Okay, uh, because he was uh, at the end of the day, he said, "Yes, I am uh, credited to your characteristic of believing me." Okay, uh, such as in accounting. God counted or credited Abel's faith as a foundation for righteousness. The underlying Hebrew verb gets at the idea of regarding something or someone as having a certain characteristic, although that thing or person may not actually have that characteristic. Okay, He credited it to him for righteousness. Verse number seven, and he, he also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. He encouraged him further because the one who would declare himself as the I am in Exodus chapter 3, okay, when Moses asked, who sent me? Who's, who's sending me? Uh, the I am is sending him. I am the Lord who brought you from the Ur of the Chaldeans. Okay, and then, uh, <laughs> then if Abraham asked another question, verse number eight, he said, okay, Lord, I, I hear you again, but uh, I, I, I got to ask another question if you don't mind. Lord God, how can I know that I will possess it? How am I going to possess the land? And he said to him, bring me a three-year-old cow, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So he brought all these to him, cut them in half, and laid the pieces opposite each other. But he did not cut the birds in half. Birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, a deep sleep came over Abram, and suddenly great terror and darkness descended on him. Then the Lord said to Abram, know this for certain. This is verse number 13, excuse me, of Genesis chapter 15. Your offspring will be resident aliens for 400 years in a land that does not belong to them and will be enslaved and oppressed. However, I will judge the nation they serve. And afterward, they will go out for many, go out with many possessions. But you will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, they will return here for the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the divided animals. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, I give this land to your offspring 
from the brook of Egypt to the great river, the, uh, the Euphrates River, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the uh, Cadmonites, Cadmonites, uh, the Hethites, the Perizzites, uh, Rephaim, Amorites, Canaanites, Gergeshites, and Jebusites. The Lord said, I'm going to further approve that I made this promise, and in making this promise, I'm going to bless your offspring. You're not going to be here to see it because you're going to die. You're going to be buried, but I am going to keep my promise, okay? I'm going to do what I said I was going to do. Now, uh, praise the Lord. Um, now, moving on, we're, we're not going to get into, you know, the, the, the chapters that come after that, or specifically get into the chapters that come uh, after that. Abram is blessed. He has uh, Ishmael, it, uh, you know, excuse me. Yeah, he has Ishmael. Then he has Isaac. The Lord blesses Isaac and things of that nature. We're going to get back. We're going to get further into this family. Okay. We'll get further into this family. So, uh, Genesis chapter 25. Uh, ha ha, ha ha, ha ha. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. Genesis chapter 25. Uh, it starts off with the genealogy of uh, Abraham's other wife and sons. Verse number one says Abraham had taken another wife whose name was Keturah. Okay, this is after Sarah died. Abraham gave everything he owed to his son Isaac because that was the firstborn. Uh, but Abraham gave gifts to the sons of his concubines. And while he was still alive, he sent them eastward away from his son Isaac to the land of the east. Abraham dies, okay, 175 years old. Ishmael's records are given in verses 12 through 18. And then we get to verse number 19 is where I want to start. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy, Jesus. We about to get into some stuff now, y'all. I tell you what the truth. Oh, thank God, Jesus. Hallelujah. <coughs> oh, Lord. I'm going to get into a few of these verses before we have to close this thing out. Genesis chapter 25, verse number 19. Genesis 25. Verse number 19, just a few chapters over. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, glory. Woo. Okay. Remember, and before we read, now let, let's read that part first. Genesis chapter 25, verse number 19. These are the family records of Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac. Now, it is important to remember what I talked about previously last week and uh, tonight, that Abraham was made a promise. You're going to, your offspring going to be blessed. And Abraham questioned, how my offspring going to be blessed? And I don't have a child. And the Lord said, I'm going to give you a child. And he said, but how am I going to get a child if my wife is barren? And the Lord said, I promise you, I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do. And Abraham said, okay, Lord, if you say so. And then I am going to touch on then when he gets to uh, uh, Abraham, uh, excuse me, the two men come uh, before, yeah, the two men come and they say that Sarah, your wife is going, and they, they're at the tip and, uh, and she's, and they say that, uh, yeah, so just chapter 18 uh, is when it talks about the two men before Sodom and Gomorrah are uh, destroyed, the, the three angels that appear, they come, and one of them is the Lord, and they come to them, and they're at the tent, and uh, Abram said, well, since y'all are here, let me feed y'all, okay? And then he said, okay, uh, that's fine, you can feed us. I want to make sure it was three. Uh, they get three men. Okay, thank you, Holy Spirit. Okay, three men. He said, let me feed y'all. And so they said, okay, you feed us. Okay. And uh, he goes to Sarah. He said, look, prepare some, some 
prepare some bread, some cakes or whatever, and bring it out here to these three men that are visiting with us. He goes get a, a cow. He uh, kills that. And he said, I, I'm going to bring you I'm gonna bring you a full course meal. And so while they're sitting there talking at the three men, he said, where's Sarah, your wife? And Abraham said, he, uh, Abraham said, she had the tent and, uh, behind us. And he said, uh, by this time next year, your wife going to have a child. And Sarah, Sarah was, look, was listening and she laughs. And one of the men who's uh, believed to be an appearance of the Lord said, well, why did your wife laugh? And Sarah's like, oh my gosh, he heard me. I didn't know I laughed out loud. I thought I was laughing to myself. I didn't know I literally laughed out loud. And so uh, he said, uh, why did she laugh? And she said, but I didn't laugh. He said, yes, she did. Yes, she did laugh. And so uh, she said, uh, uh, well, I laughed because how am I going to have five pleasure now that I'm in my OA? And, and he said, look, I'm going to do what I said I was going to do. And so Sarah Who's barren has a child. It's a miracle. How the world did that happen? She's barren. Okay. Abraham had been made a promise. Remember, God fulfills his promises. Abraham is the father of Isaac in verse number 20. Isaac was 40. Isaac was 40 years old when he took as his wife Rebecca, daughter of Bethuel. And make sure I pronounce that correctly. Bethuel, okay? Uh, the A, the Arabian from Padaram, Padaram, and sister of Laban the Arabian. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was challenged. Did y'all catch that? Okay, good. Break, join me next week. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to start right there. Genesis chapter 25, verse number 20. I want to talk about that thing. Good gracious of life and how it compares to his father, Abraham. I pray you join us if the Lord shall say the same next Wednesday night, 7 o'clock p.m. as we continue to look at this, uh, this generation, this legacy that was promised to Abraham and his family. This coming Sunday morning, I pray you join us 10.45 a.m. online or in person. You can join us in person. We pray that the Lord will meet us here. Amen. As a matter of fact, just bring the Lord with you. Whether you go view us online or whether you go come in person, bring the Lord with you so we can experience God together. Amen. To God be the glory. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this coming Friday is the last day to register to vote. If you have not done so uh, in order to participate in this year's general election. Remember, as I said last year, the year before that, I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm not endorsing one candidate over another. I'm just telling you to make sure you exercise your right to vote because we can't say anything once it's all said and done. And that, that look, we can say, well, I, I do that, blah, 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 blah. but if you don't exercise your right to vote, it, it says meaningless. But it means more if you do exercise your right to vote. Even if the candidate that you voted for does not win, at least you can say at the end of the day, I exercise my right to vote. And so uh, when folks start complaining, well, I knew it, but did you exercise your right to vote at the end of the day? So if you are not registered, all of us should be registered by now. But if you're not, and you want to participate in this year's general election, please make sure you do so before this coming Friday. It is the last day to register to vote at your local county's uh, uh, Board of Election office. Please make sure that you register if you have not done so. Amen. Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness and grace. Thank you for your word. Thank you for reminding us that, yes, we may get frustrated, but you're going to keep your promise and you're going to reassure us of that promise. And Lord, you made a promise to Abraham and we as the offspring, as the, the, the numerous stars in the sky, we as the offspring are benefited from that uh, uh, from that promise that you made to Abraham so many years ago. And God, we are so grateful and thankful. Lord, teach us how to continue to do that which you called us to do. We love you, God, and we adore you. Keep us safe from all sin and unseen danger. In Jesus' name we pray. Got every single thing done. And all those that believe said, Amen. God, my God, God is good. Oh, God, my God, God is good. I 
said he brought me out of darkness. God is good.